Thank you very much. Moving on, I would like to entertain a motion to JFS House Bill 5210 to the floor. Motion by Representative Lesser, second by Representative Albus. Is there any discussion? Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got uh, quite a few uh, notes and questions on, on the bill before us, so uh, bear with me a little bit because I tried to keep everything in some kind of organized fashion, but uh, not so easy sometimes. I, I'm just hoping that maybe right out of the gate uh, the chairman might share with us what the purpose of the legislation is before us. Thank you, Representative Sampson. The purpose of this bill is, is very, very simple. Under the Affordable Care Act that was passed at the federal level, there were a list of protections in that law that guaranteed various things that are outlined in this bill, such as the 10 essential health benefits that protect all consumers from insurance policies that in the past, before the ACA became the law of the land, were not adequate enough in terms of ensuring that they were covering the things that most people expect from insurance, such as going to the hospital, getting lab work done, getting mental health services. And so in the wake of what's happening down in Washington, where there have been numerous proposals to repeal the Affordable Care Act, none of which have been successful yet, but that's not for lack of trying on their part, we wanted to say to the residents of Connecticut that no matter what happens in Washington, no matter who is president, no matter who is in control of Congress, that we believe that these are laws these are rights that should be put into state statute to ensure that no matter what happens to the ACA, no matter what happens to politics in Washington, that folks can be assured that these benefits will remain in Connecticut law. And that is the intention that, that we seek to put forward this bill today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I share the uh, concern about uh, being able uh, to uh, make our own laws as a sovereign uh, state uh, and not necessarily uh, be forced by the federal government to uh, follow whatever they decide is appropriate nationally. I think it's very important that we maintain our choice to determine what uh, coverages belong in insurance policies. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic with regard to that. The title of the bill says uh, mandating insurance coverage of essential benefits and expanding mental health benefits for women, children, adolescents. So your description was about the first half, uh, which was to uh, retain the essential health benefits package that uh, is part of Obamacare. Uh, but it also says expanding uh, benefits for women, children, and adolescents. I'm uh, hoping you can tell me what is expanded. And also, why limit to just women, children, and adolescents, and not all citizens? Certainly a fair question, Representative Sampson. What the bill does mostly in the section, we can certainly go through it, and I think we may be about to go through it in, in greater detail, but many of the things enumerated in here dealing with women's health care that begin in section three and four are dealing with preventative health care screenings for women in large part that are almost Everything in Section 3 and 4 is currently covered under the ACA when it comes to women. Uh, last year, our committee had a bill, 586, that dealt just with women. Um, what we wanted to do this year is to make sure that it was going to deal with everybody, which is where the essential health benefits come in. So um, everybody is impacted by the essential health benefits being law. Everyone, in my personal opinion, is benefiting from the fact that they are in law. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we talked about the women's health care issues because I think it's a proven statistic that women have greater health care needs than men and a lot of the services that are provided in section three or four would certainly not be applicable to you or I um, but are very very important to women uh, and we make sure that we're not just covering women um, because of the sections one and two which deal with all benefits for all people. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate what you're what you're saying. Uh, the only thing I would say about that really is that looking at the bill, it seems to uh, indicate certain types of coverage which I think should apply to both men and women, but it specifically only 
enumerates women in the bill. And uh, it, uh, certainly I want to make sure that uh, women, uh, children, and adolescents, as the title of the bill says, are afforded the best possible health care uh, across the world. Uh, we can have a small element of control in our state, and I want to make sure we get it right. But on uh, lines 86, 87, 88, 89, and so on, uh, domestic and uh, interpersonal violence screening and counseling for any woman. I understand that might be much more prevalent, but I notice it says only women, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to why that is. Tobacco use intervention and cessation counseling. Uh, to be honest, I don't know if this is something that belongs in an insurance policy uh, that we would mandate people uh, are provided coverage for and therefore charged for, but again, it says only women. Can you tell me why we are limiting these two provisions to only females? We're not limiting it to just only females. In my opinion, what we're doing is we're just saying very clearly that we are going to cover these things for women um, because of the desire for people um, to be able to have that right. A lot of times, um, you know, at the risk of being overly general here, a lot of people, especially women, are included on somebody else's health insurance policy. And what I worry about, and I think the authors of the, of the bill worry about, is that sometimes um, women who are seeking to get services that are enumerated in these sections here um, would have to go to their spouse and basically get that spouse's buy-in to go and do things like a domestic violence um, screening or counseling. Um, and what we want to make sure is that no matter what, they're going to have that right regardless of what the policy is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the answer, although I, I got to tell you, I'm a little sensitive to the way we're uh, treating women as somehow they are unable to make their own decisions. I, I think that they are as equally capable of doing that as men, and I don't believe we should distinguish in our laws uh, between the, uh, the genders. Um, just moving on, um, is it true that there are a number of these items that do absolutely go beyond what is currently required by federal law. The one item that I would draw your attention to that is different from federal law is in section 11, which is lines 277 through 285, um, which creates or allows women to get a 12-month supply of a contraception and the reason for doing that, which is different than federal law, is simply to make women's lives easier. Um, this would allow a woman to go to the doctor and get a year's worth of prescription for something the doctor has sanctioned that is okay for them to use for their contraception, rather than having to continue going to the doctor multiple times a year. Thank you. I, uh, I, I've, someone prepared a list for me of, of a number of items that are contained in the bill that actually go beyond the uh, the current federal law. Uh, but I honestly, I don't want to delay the, the debate uh, based on that. But suffice it to say, there are quite a few things uh, that do go beyond it. So to say that we are simply codifying what the Obamacare requirement was federally in state statute is not accurate. Uh, and I can understand why people would be sympathetic to that, but now we are actually creating more and more insurance mandates. I would also say that uh, to say that we are allowing women access is a misinterpretation of what's happening here. I mean, this bill would create a requirement for insurance carriers to provide this coverage to every consumer, whether they want it or not. And I'll certainly talk about that more uh, in a moment. But the next question is, who exactly is affected by this law? If it becomes, uh, if this bill passes and becomes law in Connecticut, who is uh, subject to this requirement, Mr. Chairman? Any consumer in this state who is using a uh, insurance policy that is not regulated by the federal government under ERISA. Thank you for the answer, Mr. Chairman, but, but the law doesn't uh, uh, require anything of citizens. It requires something of insurance companies, if I'm correct. Correct. It requires them to sell policies at the individual and group uh, level that would cover these enumerated, what I'm going to refer to as rights. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do they not currently sell these products already? 
They do because they're being required to do so by the Affordable Care Act. Right. And, and before the Affordable Care Act, were these uh, uh, particular coverages that were in the essential health benefits package uh, uh, afforded in Connecticut? Did insurance companies sell, sell those products to consumers? I'm not off the top of my head able to give you that answer, but I believe that one of the reasons why the Affordable Care Act was passed and so heavily debated was because people felt like their insurance was not covering a lot of the things that are listed here, and therefore they asked you know, their representatives to go down there and work on a bill that would try to fix some of the problems that they perceive to be having with their insurance carriers and their insurance coverage. Understood. I, I'm, I have a good authority that uh, the state of Connecticut uh, already complied with the essential health benefits package prior to Obamacare. So all of these coverages have been available for purchase in our state over time since long before Obamacare. Uh, but I appreciate the, the other answer, which is to say that this bill would say that every insurance policy must include these products, but it does not apply to every insurance company. Uh, it only uh, uh, applies to uh, insurance products that are sold uh, to consumers through the individual and group market, but not self-insured plans, which uh, every uh, one of us uh, on this panel uh, all have that type of insurance. Uh, essentially, self-insured plans are not subject to that requirement, uh, and I'm told that represents as much as 40% of the population. Uh, is there a reason why we did not make this requirement of those self-insured plans? Why, why would we exclude a whole 40% of the public if this is such a good idea, Mr. Chairman? There's no reason. This is not an intentional thing, but it's something we can certainly look at in the future if you want to join, join up with that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll just pause for a moment and make it absolutely clear that uh, I would like nothing more than the best possible health care available to every citizen in our state. Um, I think that uh, health care is expensive and I think that uh, it is prohibitively costly in many cases uh, and dangerously so. And any, um, uh, I don't know, inference that someone might get that uh, I'm opposed to women's health uh, care, regardless how I feel about this bill, is positively ridiculous. And um, I just want to make that absolutely clear that our motivations on this panel are always to make sure that uh, we are looking out for the best interests of consumers and that re means regardless of uh, race or gender or religion or anything else. Uh, speaking of which, well, you know, I'm going I'm to get to both of those questions in a moment, but let me just ask another quick question, which is um, if this bill before us provides for coverages that are beyond the requirement that already exists in our Connecticut law, that will generate a cost. And uh, that cost will be borne by either premium payers or taxpayers in some way. And it is my understanding that bills that uh, uh, develop a cost must go to the Appropriations Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is there a reason why this bill is being JF to the floor and not to appropes as it's supposed to be? I would argue that this in some ways, if we look at that 12-month prescription, would actually save money because somebody would be able to go once to get a 12-month prescription as opposed to going numerous times throughout the year. And so I, I don't view this as something that's going to unnecessarily cost more money uh, and therefore, that's why it's not going to go to the Appropriations Committee. Yeah, I've spoken with a number of people about uh, what's in the bill, and there is absolutely going to be an expansion of benefits here, and therefore, an expansion of cost. If the argument is that this is uh, not an expansion of benefits, um, then I could understand that. But uh, we've been talking for the last 15 minutes about how this provides new and additional coverages for consumers in the state, and that has to cost something. So uh, my understanding is this bill uh, ought to go to uh, the Appropriations Committee. And uh, at the end of our debate, I'm going to make a motion that it, it go to that committee properly. So in the meantime, I just want to bring up uh, a couple of quick things. So well, let me, let me ask that question, really. I mean, do additional uh, coverages for insurance um, raise additional costs in your experience, Mr. Chairman? So, again, for, for the record, 
the ma overwhelming majority of things in this bill are things that are already being covered under individual and group insurance policies in the state of Connecticut thanks to the Affordable Care Act. So I don't think we should give off the impression at all, and I'm not saying that you're necessarily trying to do this, that this bill is a whole bunch of new mandates that the insurance companies are going to be slapped with. I don't think that's accurate. I don't think that's an accurate reflection of the majority of this bill. When I look at the Affordable Care Act, I don't see that as a perfect system. I don't think anybody that's on this committee would look at that and think it's a perfect bill. Our job is obviously not to fix the Affordable Care Act. That's the job of our representatives in Washington. Our job is to look out for our constituents in, that are represented here on this committee at the, at the state legislature and, and ask ourselves what is in their best interest. And in my opinion, codifying into state law what we know are the most popular provisions of the ACA. There are some unpopular things about the ACA. These things enumerated in here are not them. These things have high approval ratings. They are things that people really like and they're fortunate they now have in their coverage. And any expansion that's in this bill, the limited expansions that there are, are things that I believe really are not going to put additional stresses on the insurance carriers. Because a lot of them, to your point earlier, are already covering some of these things. And you said that they have been covering them for some time in Connecticut. And therefore, I just don't believe that this is something that's going to cause an additional burden on the insurance companies. And with that said, I think it's something that's going to really benefit our constituents. And I think all of us, as you said earlier, are here to benefit those constituents. And I believe this bill does that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I don't disagree with a lot of what you said. Uh, I, I certainly believe that um, uh, these coverages have existed over time and they do exist and I do believe that they can in fact be a benefit to the majority of consumers. My main concern is that much like we are passing uh, or debating this bill rather to uh, for the express purpose of declaring our own sovereignty as a state to say that if the federal government decides to change the rules on us, that we don't care what the federal government says. We're going to do what we want to do because we are Connecticut and we can make our own decisions and we can make our own personal choice as a state as what to do. Well, much like that, I believe that consumers should have that same exact choice. And that's what this debate is about. It is not about whether or not these are positive coverages that would benefit people. We know that they are positive coverages that would benefit people. The concern I have is that this bill, if the ACA is repealed, and in the case of the expanded benefits, does not give consumers a choice. It takes choice away from people, particularly women. They are going to be provided these coverages whether they want them or not. They are in effect forced, much like we were forced to subscribe to the ACA and other federal law we, if we pass this bill, are forcing women, some of them willing, but some against their will, to purchase products that they don't want. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. And uh, I don't know if it's been distributed yet, but I'd like to get it distributed, and I'll just tell everybody what it says. It's very short. It simply says that as far as the um, insurance policies offered in Connecticut, uh, we would actually modify this bill to say that any policy offered in Connecticut must offer these expanded coverages. In other words, if you're an insurance company doing business in Connecticut, you must, you must make these policies and these coverages available to every consumer so they can buy them. But at the same time, we're not forcing them. We're not telling you you have to buy tobacco cessation. Maybe you don't smoke. You get to decide. You have empowerment. You know, I trust uh, the citizens of the state, Mr. Chairman, to make good determinations about their own health care. I trust women enough to be able to choose what they want to do with their own bodies when it comes to health care. And that's the purpose of this amendment. Has it been distributed yet? It's going around the room. By all means, so I I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I sense a disconnect uh, when we try and say we're actually benefiting the rights of women and at the same time we are limiting the rights of women by saying that they don't get to choose 
what the type of insurance policies they purchase are. I think these are good policies. I think that people should purchase them. But I also believe that people make personal choice based on a lot of things. The type of coverages they feel they need, whether they're exposed as a smoker to requiring a tobacco cessation product someday, and the cost of insurance, which is spiraling out of control, partly because we keep telling consumers that they don't get to choose what coverages they want to buy. We keep telling them, you have to buy this insurance. You have to buy this insurance. I don't think that's right in America. I think we should say, look, these policies are good. These things are valuable coverages. We suggest you buy them, but you are free citizens. You get to make up your own mind. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I submit this amendment uh, for a vote on the committee to be adopted uh, to this bill, and uh, I make that motion. And um, I'd like a roll call vote if I could. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. You make the motion. Is there a second on the amendment? Second by. Any discussion on the amendment? Representative Lesser. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and through you to the proponent of the amendment. A question here. I don't see any language that excludes um, self-insured plans. Are self-insured plans covered by this amendment? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, uh, Representative Sampson. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and through you to uh, this, my distinguished colleague. No, uh, the underlying bill does not affect self-insured plans, uh, and this amendment being an amendment of choice would mean that self-insured plans would also have the choice to offer coverages. As you know, uh, as a participant in our self-insured plan that we have as uh, uh, state employees, as much as I hate to admit it, um, we uh, we often get the same benefits because the self-insured plans uh, do thankfully adopt uh, these uh, mandates when they when they come forward. So I have no doubt that they will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so through you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, to the proponent of the amendment, uh, given that um, isn't uh, isn't our ability to regulate self-insured plans limited by ERISA? Uh, how does this? Uh, and if so, uh, how does this amendment not conflict with limitations imposed on us by the U.S. Constitution? Through you, Mr. Sp Mr. Chairman. Through you. I apologize. Through you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and through you, uh, it simply does not affect self-insured plans, just like the underlying bill does not. And, uh, again, it's an amendment based on freedom. It says that insurance carriers should be uh, uh, you know, offering coverages to consumers, and consumers should be allowed to choose which coverages they want. Representative Lesser. Uh, and through you to the, just for purposes of, estab of establishing legislative intent, it's the intent of the proponent of this bill uh, that the freedom that women would uh, enjoy if this amendment would have passed would be the freedom to not have 10 essential health benefits currently required by, the, by uh, federal law. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sampson. Mr. Chairman, this amendment applies only to the expanded coverages, not the essential benefits package. But uh, it does uh, essentially give the choice to consumers. It would, when you are purchasing insurance, you would be asked, would you like to have coverage for tobacco cessation, for instance? And it will be up to that consumer to decide that for themselves. I, I don't understand why that seems to be so controversial in today's day and age, uh, Mr. Chairman. Representative Lester. So specifically, if the, if the purpose is only to expand, to apply to the expanded coverage, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to the proponent of the amendment, uh, my understanding is the expanded coverage is limited to allowing women to purchase up to 12 months of contraceptives. Um, if this amendment were not to pass, is there anything in the law that would prohibit a woman from seeking a prescription of less than 12 months? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sampson. I don't think so, Mr. Chairman, but I also think that's a good idea. I think that uh, women should be able to choose. Some women have no interest in contraceptives whatsoever. So if we require all insurance policies to have it, people will be paying needlessly for that, not to mention paying for their neighbors' coverages that they don't even use themselves. This would allow people to choose the coverages they want for themselves based on their own needs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think, th uh, I think uh, Representative Lesser. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the uh, uh, honorable ranking member's answers to the questions. I, I think this amendment is unnecessary. First of all, I think women uh, are not being required to uh, purchase one year's 
uh, coverage for contraceptives if they don't want that. that there's nothing in here that requires anybody to get anything they don't want. But I think the amendment speaks to the whole purpose of health insurance, which is to cover uh, events that uh, are out there. If, if all you want is to provide health care services uh, that you need at this exact moment, uh, then there's no need for insurance. You just go out and pay for what you want uh, out of pocket. Uh, but that, that's not what insurance is there for. Um, I have health insurance coverage uh, to protect against cancer, uh, whether or not I have cancer right now. And that's the whole purpose of having health insurance. So I, uh, I respectfully uh, oppose this amendment, uh, and I uh, support the underlying bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Stanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just as a simple reply to that, I'd say that's, that's a gross mischaracterization of what's happening here. Uh, we do a fine job on this committee, and so does the state insurance department, of making sure that consumers are protected, that insurance companies are regulated, and that insurance policies that are offered in the state do adequately cover people. But there are loads and loads of optional coverages in this world, and they are driving up the cost and making it so people end up going without insurance. I want to see that end. I want to see people be able to choose cheaper options for insurance because they're making their own decisions about what kind of coverage they want. If they're not actively engaged in uh, uh, you know, uh, relations with someone, then they're not going to be interested in contraception coverage. They will not be interested in pregnancy coverage. It might drive down the rate of their policy dramatically and make it more affordable. I believe that the uh, beauty of America is freedom. And when we start deciding in this body that individual citizens don't get to choose what type of insurance they want to buy, and we are going to decide for them, we are flying in the face of what America is. We need to actually get back to our roots, which is to say, this is a great place because people get to decide their own fate and their own future, and they should make their own decisions, especially when it comes to women and their own bodies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Dela Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, more of a statement. I, I hear over and over, and not only in this committee, but in the in the hallways, about how freedom uh, drives this country and how we have to keep going back to our roots and and, and not require folks to have insurance. I got to remind you, I have a grandson that's on the way. Um, he doesn't know it, but he's affecting the healthcare system today. He's he's about he's going to do in September, by the way. And already, my my daughter has seen a doctor, gotten vitamins, under the care of a doctor. Uh, so this is the one industry in America that we continue to keep saying that it's okay for you not to have it, but if you need it, we're there for you. And I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the people that pay for that. I pay $10.50 an hour, and I've been doing that for the last 10 years through the union to basically provide myself for insurance. So when I hear people tell me that it's free, and I've worked with folks that make $100,000 a year, and, and we keep hearing how it's their responsibility, we, we, don't, we don't have any citizens that we know that, that, wouldn't, that aren't responsible. I, I, would, I would say this guy wasn't responsible when he didn't purchase insurance for him and his family at making 100000 a year. So for me, I, I think we need to capture those people and, uh, and basically make them responsible for the party of personal responsibility, for fiscal responsibility. I'm surprised that that, that, that sentiment would be coming from the side of, of, of not making folks pay for something that they actually can't afford. So... I, I, am ho I am really hoping that we can get this thing through because I know my premiums cannot accept any more increases uh, and won't be able to afford it. If, if we allow people to practice freedom and their freedom is just to walk in the hospital when they need care, then, then we're, we're going to be in for some big trouble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I could not agree with my colleague, Representative Dela Cruz, a anymore. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the problem is that we live in a society which is increasingly more government controlled and more socialist. Just like this um, proposal uh, tries to uh, make everyone pay for other person's uh, coverages that they don't purchase themselves, you're absolutely right. When you walk into an emergency room today, there's a good chance that you are going to be treated uh, even if you don't have insurance. And keep in mind that uh, you know, people that uh, are well off uh, will ultimately pay in some way. Either they're going to be sent to collections or they're going to uh, ruin their credit score uh, in the future and so forth. And, and you're right, maybe some people don't care. Uh, but, Representative, that is an entirely different issue. Making insurance cost more by requiring policies cover more and more things all the time is not the answer to that. 
the, the, the answer is to hold people accountable for their own choices. Let them choose the type of insurance they want and also only give them the coverages that they pay for. That's the world we ought to live in. And when we start telling everyone that they have to pay for everyone else, that's the problems that we see in our society today. This only takes us more in that direction. I want to see women have these coverages, but I want them to do it because they choose to, not because we tell them they have to against their will. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate you offering this amendment. I appreciate the discussion that we're having, but I am going to urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment because I believe that when we create tiered systems of health care, the consumer ultimately does not benefit from that. And when we tell people that a better plan that covers basic, to me, basic fundamental human health care rights would be more expensive than another plan, people, whether they're men, whether they're women, no matter where they live in the state, are going to be faced with the same decision that they often face, which is that they cannot afford to get the same benefits that others would have when it comes to basic health care rights. And so I know we have an ideological disagreement on this, um, but to me, this amendment will create some of the problems that existed before the Affordable Care Act passed when people had two different kinds of health care based on what they could afford, not what was, to me, should be the rights of citizens to have when it comes to their policies. So, I urge my members to vote against this amendment, and I urge, uh, ask the clerk to call the roll. Larson? No. Kelly? Yes. Scanlon? Yes. Dela Cruz? Yes. Dela Cruz? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Bertel? Yes. Sampson? Yes. Ackert? Yes. Alvis? Yes. Delnicki? Yes. Florin? Johnson? No. Lesser? No. Paolillo? No. D'Amato? Polilla? Pal oh, po Paolillo? Here it is. D'Amato. Poletta? Riley, no. Seagrass, yes. Steinberg, no. Vale, yes. Zygos, no. 10 yay, 11 nay. The amendment fails. Back to the original discussion on the bill. Is there any further discussion? Representative Sampson. Mr. Chairman, we had some uh, testimony from uh, some religious entities uh, in our state uh, that stated that the bill before us differs from the existing uh, federal requirement for a religious exemption. And I'll be completely honest that I am not an expert on what the federal law says or this bill it does, uh, and I'm hoping we can get some help if we need to clear it up. But I did not see this as a, um, uh, a, a amendment that runs afoul of the uh, the purposes of your bill. Um, and it's, I want to offer this amendment that changes uh, sections 11 and 12 to redefine uh, prescription contraceptive methods with contraceptive methods and related services. My understanding is the, the verbiage is important because that essentially is how it's characterized in federal law to provide for the proper religious exemption. And I would urge adoption of this amendment so that uh, if your intent is to mirror the federal law as far as the essential health benefits package goes, uh, that you also mirror the federal religious exemption. Um, and uh, I'd like a roll call vote on the amendment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. It's my understanding of this bill that there are quite, um, quite a few protections in here um, in the sections you reference 11 and 12 that begin on lines 309 um, and really do offer, in, in my opinion, substantial protections when it comes to employers or employees who are not comfortable with insurance policies 
that do allow for certain reproductive rights and contraception. And I would ask the, the representative to walk me through where he feels his amendment would strengthen this bill as opposed to the language that's currently in there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, searching through the testimony to find the testimony of some representatives of the Catholic Church. I think I have just found it, and I suspect that information is contained in their testimony. Uh, it's up to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you want to uh, just have the members take a look at this testimony briefly, uh, or do you, would you like me to read it from for the record? Yeah, I, I'm just interested to hear your wh where you think, so we can have a, a discussion about this, where you think that, that this is applying to this bill, or, or not applying. Yeah, I mean, forgive me that uh, I, I saw the final version of this bill at 8.40 p.m. last night, and I did not have a chance to go through the... Uh, uh, the wording line by line uh, to be able to come up with uh, a proper response. I'm merely acting uh, in good faith that I've been told that we need to make this uh, minor, minor change to uh, encapsulate the federal religious exemption. If you uh, disagree, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's, that's all I can do. I can say that I offered it, and I hope that we'll consider it if the bill moves forward. Thank you, Representative. And I will give you my, my word here before you today as a practicing Catholic, uh, since we're talking about, you know, potentially concerns that they had, that if this is not, if we can find out what this is, perhaps you and I can together meet with them and sit down and see what the difference is here. Um, but from my reading of the bill, um, I just do not believe that this bill does not offer the protections that are currently in federal law um, due to the Hobby Lobby decision that was, you know, made by the Supreme Court a few years ago. I believe that this encompasses, you know, what was the result of that decision. Um, and I think that I would prefer to we do not adopt this amendment today. We move this bill out of committee and we keep working on this going forward. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I don't mean to speak after you on this. I just found the section in their testimony that's relevant. Uh, and as, as they simply say that uh, the currently proposed language may be interpreted to mean that the Catholic Church can exclude con contraceptives from its employees' insurance plans, but be required to cover sterilizations. Uh, the Catholic Conference does not believe this is the intent of the proposed legislation. Whether you agree or disagree with them or whether or not that is the case, uh, the fact is that uh, this goes back to uh, my underlying argument about this bill, which is that we are telling people that they have to do something here. We are making a law that requires people, whether they want to or not, to buy certain types of insurance policy. And unless we adopt this amendment, we are telling people that have religious objections that they have to do things also. And I just don't see any point in doing that, Mr. Chairman. I urge adoption. Thank you, Representative Sampson. Um, again, I uh, respect your right to put this amendment forward, and I um, am certainly intrigued just to find out what the answer is here. Um, but for the purposes of just moving this bill out of committee and then promising you that I will look into this and work with you on it, uh, I would urge members to vote no. Um, is there a second on Representative Sampson's amendment? Representative Pavlok D'Amato. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Larson? No. Kelly? Yes. Scanlon? No. Dela Cruz? No. Hartley? Boutel? Yes. Sampson? Yes. Ackert? Yes. Albus? No. Delnicki? Florin? Johnson? No. Lexer? No. Paolillo? D'Amato? Yes. Poletta? Yes. Riley? No. Segrist? Yes. Steinberg? Vail? Yes. Sayogas? No. Hartley?
10, 10. The amendment fails. Any further discussion? Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a final word and we'll move on. I'll just, I'll just in closing, I will, I will say that, you know, I'm always happy to have an ideological debate uh, with anyone, uh, constituents, uh, and certainly here at the Capitol, and I, and I really genuinely appreciate having a discussion uh, along ideological lines, especially when it comes to things like this, because I, I think it's educational. I always learn something about the perspective of other people, uh, especially ones that I disagree with, because I believe they're acting in good faith. They believe that they are uh, genuinely uh, believe that uh, they are doing right by uh, their constituents uh, when they are um, arguing points that differ with mine. Uh, I just want to make it clear that uh, I hope they look at me the same way. Uh, my uh, goals uh, with regard to this particular bill is uh, to make sure, as they do, uh, to um, stand for the best possible uh, protection and uh, health coverage uh, for women, children, adolescents, and everyone in our society. And um, I just believe the best way to go about that is to ensure women's choice. I, women, uh, you know, were not allowed the right to vote in this country for a long time. And uh, they have struggled with uh, uh, difficulties in uh, re uh, obtaining equality in our society in a lot of measures. There is a constant battle over the rights of abortion. Uh, that have to do with uh, women's choice to make their own decision without the government telling them what to do. And in this particular case, we have a bill that essentially requires women to buy insurance whether they want it or not. And in some cases, that's clearly going to be against their will. To me, this is very illustrative of the differences between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the Democrat Party, uh, in my experience, uh, believes that the government uh, has a role in the lives of people and uh, can make the world a better place by creating policies uh, that they feel are appropriate for our citizens. And I certainly respect and understand that. But as a Republican, I would say to them that they should understand that they don't speak for every person and that uh, there are plenty of people in this world who want to make their own choice uh, that may not disagree with what's best for them that's decided for them by the government. And they should be afforded the opportunity in America, of all places, the <laughs> land of freedom, where uh, we started our country based on the notion that people were being uh, taxed uh, in a way, charged in a way for things that they did not want to be charged for, uh, when in fact the government is responsible to them. This bill is charging people for things that they may or may not choose. It is fundamentally against our way of life in this country, and I think it's uh, educational from that re regard. I stand for the freedom for women to choose what type of insurance and health coverage they buy, and that's why I will be voting no on this bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Representative Vail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a few clarifying questions, if I can. can um, a lot of it, I think, was covered earlier, but I just want to clarify a few things. Was the intention of this bill um, to protect the 10 essential benefits that we talked about earlier? Was that the original intention of this bill if the Affordable Care Act is repealed? Is that my understanding correct? So that is, that is what we're talking about this for today. But I would note for you, as Representative Simpson alluded to earlier, several years ago before you and I were in the legislature, under the Obama administration, they did codify several of these uh, benefits into state law. So it wasn't about who was president, because at the time, the guy who was president was the guy who wrote this law. They did it because they thought that this was good policy. And so, yes, we are here today to talk about this because there are threats to these rights under the Affordable Care Act down in Washington. Um, but we're having this conversation that has been had for a long time in Connecticut based on whether we think these are good rights for our constituents to have, no matter who is president. And I, and I can understand that. So again, the original intention is to protect those rights and the 10 essential benefits. Is that correct? Correct. And then there's a part, there's two parts to this bill. And the other one is expanding mandated health benefits. And you said earlier that that is only um, in regards to uh, the 12-month prescription um, 
for birth control. Is that correct? In contraceptives? It is not only that, but that is the biggest one in there that I believe Representative Sampson was sort of alluding to. So and there, that's why. there are other expansions above and beyond what the ACA um, covers now. Is that correct? There is a small amount, but again, the, the basis of this bill, almost 90% of this bill, are things that are already in law at the federal level. A lot of them are already in law in Connecticut, not all of them, and there are a few expansions such as the 12-month contraception. Was there ever considered, I mean, to me, these are two separate issues. They should be two separate bills. Um, was it ever considered to do this as two separate bills? I don't know that we considered it to do two separate bills. I view these as very similar in the sense that they are taking a look at some things that people have come to expect from their health care policies, from their insurance policies when it comes to getting health care. Whether they're a man, a woman, young, old, these are things that I believe are important for consumers of insurance in the state, and that's why I believe we, we combine them. You know, but it's difficult if one was to agree with the, the concept of the first piece to keep those 10 essential benefits in place, but disagree with the mandated expansion, or at least want to have a different discussion about that, um, doesn't give you much of a choice by putting them both in the same bill. I think it's far reaching. And I think it puts us in an un, you know, people that might want to vote one way on one part of it and another way, we're not, you know, given that opportunity. I certainly could, you know, propose another amendment to eliminate the expanding part of that, um, but I won't. But, you know, that's my concern. And again, you know, I'm going to leave it at that. But that's my concern with this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Senator Berthel, followed by Representative Acker. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I'm going to flag this for today. This has been a very interesting debate this morning and rolling now after 12 noon into the afternoon. Uh, but I think that until we can iron out the uh, religious exemption language to your point, and I'll take you at your word, Mr. Chair, that we'll work to, uh, to try to bring that correction. I've read through the testimony here. I don't want to belabor this at this point in time, but I'm going to be a no today just to flag this so that we can uh, have a further discussion on the bill. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. Representative Ackert. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and all the good dialogue that we've had so far. I just need some clarity. I just uh, I get the uh, wonderful opportunity to meet with my insurance. I have an insurance uh, policy with my company, and I just saw all the new rate increases that I, I get to somehow um, move on to my uh, customers uh, to provide health insurance for the people that earn it in my company. And I'm curious as to lines uh, 182 to 186, 196 to 200, 210 to 214, in terms of cost, because it says that in, uh, of these policies, um, no such policy shall impose a coinsurance, copayment, deductible, or other ex expense. So how is that um, handled in terms of developing a policy for like a small company like myself, larger company, in terms of um, how does that roll into the cost of an insurance plan? Thank you, Representative. That's a hard question for me to answer on the face of it without knowing specifically who your insurance company is, what your policy looks like today, how many employees you have. It's, it's impossible, I think, for me to answer that question. And totally understand that. And that is my concern as I'm trying to afford insurance for my company when it says that these policies, my wife looked this over, she's in the health, in the health, in the insurance policy, she says, boy, I would love to have my chemo um, cancer um, um, appointments with no copay. We love it. How does that work when someone that has, gets a, a diagnosis like that or MS that they have no uh, co-insurance, uh, not self-imposed, um, you know, issues. So I, I have pause on this. I believe in the value of this, this language and the value to keep these policies, but I get concerned when we kind of pick and choose winners, sort of say, in who gets, you know, n no co-pays. 
and you know those that can control the, you know their their livelihoods as opposed to those who can't in terms of their their uh, health. So I'm going to uh, probably do the opposite of this is you know potentially uh, move this along and see how we can in, can change it. But I'd like to get some answers, and maybe people in the insurance field can can give me those answers. Is how does this affect? I used to have wonderful plans for my company. And now I look at each of my employees, and we, to be honest with you, that sit up here with wonderful health plans, right, paid for by the good taxpayers of the state of Connecticut, get health plans like this, $5,300 individually out of pocket, and they have to pay their co-pays. So their co-pays goes towards their 5300 so they get nothing. 10000 for a family. And these things are what's happening in the real world. So when my employees, male and female, go to these, these insurance plans, they're paying for these, in, in, these co-pays. And sometimes I think we as a group that, lo that have these wonderful uh, plans need to look at what the real world is out there when we impose these insurance mandates. And that's my concern with some insurance. Listen, I would love to include my wife's um, you know, two, three times a month, you know, uh, going to the cancer doctor, plan in here, you know, because, but she can't, that, that's not in here. And so, uh, luckily we have a decent health plan or I probably wouldn't have a house to be honest. And I would accept that, but we need to look at some of the things that we do here as a body and well-intentioned, well-intentioned. Can we afford it? Can the people that we impose, the employees out there, that get this because I'm not, they're not, I'm not self-insured. I don't have a self-insured plan. As uh, the good uh, Matt Lesser, uh, Representative Lesser brought up about the self-insured piece, they're not in this plan. Uh, so I struggle with this. I really, really do. And I understand the value of this. But we have good plans. The people out there pay for this. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Acker. And, and, and I would just say, before we go to Representative Paletta, I hear you. And I think that you're raising some really important questions. The only thing I would say in response to that is most of the things, almost all of the things in here that we're saying don't have a copay are preventative services. So the, the section that you just referenced, 187, deals with immunizations for children. You know, um, we can have a debate in this committee, thank God we're not going to, on the benefits of socialized medicine and, and making this free for everybody across the board. We're not doing that today. What we're doing today, in my mind, is taking a look at a bunch of what I, again, keep referring to as rights. The right to preventative health care, the right to making sure you're not going to have a cap when it comes to your insurance. All those things, I think, are basic rights that are being covered right now under insurance policy in the state. And if we pass this law, they're still going to be covered. So just as I can't sit here and tell you specifically that your insurance is not going to go up because of this, I also can't tell you that it will go up either. Because if they testify that this is not a different set of circumstances than they're already dealing with, I'm not sure what would make it go up if it hasn't gone up in the sense that this has been a right before. So I guess what I'm saying is I hear what you're saying. Uh, I understand this is an important issue for you to think about, and I respect that, but I would just emphasize the fact that these are already covered, and most of them are preventative. They're not necessarily um, comprehensive treatments that we're saying, you know, you get no copay, you don't. Representative Paletta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we can all agree that um, you've done a great job at answering our questions um, this morning into the afternoon. Uh, as a, a business owner, as vice president of a family-owned uh, business, I'm extremely proud that we provide health insurance to not only our employees, their spouses, and their children. Um, with that being said, the ACA has been a disaster. It has uh, increased costs for my business. Uh, I've had to pass it on to the employee uh, for lower hourly wage, and I have several reservations, which I won't get into today, about the ACA. Uh, my question today is, when you turn on the television, all you hear about is health care, the economy, and the border. Those are the three things you hear about all the time, right? Those are 
arguably the top three um, topics that come up on any news network. Um, there's been a lot of talk about reforming the ACA, repealing it, replacing it. I don't think Congress does their job, but that's just my opinion. Um, if they repeal the law and replace it, and we pass this bill, does then the federal government supersede this bill and it would, in essence, go away if it's something opposite than of what we passed today? It's a complicated question to answer, uh, given that in the history of our country, there have been a lot of times where states have not followed the direction of federal laws, um, and it gets into complicated, tricky ground. I think the answer to your question is yes, uh, it might, but there are other answers to that question that I'm not qualified to tell you as somebody who never went to law school, but I'm sure some smart people in this building would try to figure that out. Okay, so in essence, we're saying that we would potentially pass this today, um, send it out, you know, out of committee, and in the near future, if this law does get repealed and replaced, then, then this is kind of in limbo. We may not even, in essence, be in coherence with the federal law. So maybe this law would just go away without any of our doing. You know, I have a problem with that. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. And what I would just say to that, um, I understand what your perspective is, Representative Paletta. My perspective is we are going on the record today to address an issue that I agree with you is something that comes up almost every time I'm at the grocery store when I'm knocking on doors. This is what people talk about. They talk about health care. And there's a lot of unpopular things about the ACA that I would even concede to you are unpopular with my constituents in my district and probably in your district to varying degrees probably. But um, this is not one of them. These are the things that when you ask people about the ACA, yeah, they don't like the individual mandate. Yeah, they don't like the fact that it, you know, in their mind it may have been caused their premiums to go up a little bit, but they do like the fact that they're not going to be discriminated against because they have a pre-existing condition, the fact that they're going to be able to get mental health services for their nephew who, um, you know, is struggling with the opioid addiction. These are the popular parts of the ACA. Um, I get there's other parts that people don't like, but this is the parts that people, I think, do like. And today the question before us is not so much about do we like the ACA, do we want to fix it, because all of us, could probably get in a room and give some ideas to Congress and the President on that. What we're saying is that these are things we feel like are important for our constituents to have no matter what, and no matter what happens with legal challenges and court cases and all that stuff, we're going on the record to say we like this or we don't like this, and that to me is, is where we're at today. Is there any further discussion on this bill? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Larson? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Scanlon? Yes. De La Cruz? Hartley, yes. Bertel, yes. Sampson, yes. Acker, Albus, yes. Delnicki, yes. Florin, yes. Johnson, yes. Lesser, yes. Paolillo, yes. DeMaio, no. Paol uh, Poletta, no. Riley, yes. Segrist, yes. Steinberg, yes. Vail, no. Sayogas. Thank you.